This video is sponsored by Factor. In my previous video of this homemade autonomous boat, I failed at a 56 kilometer or 35 mile waypoint mission in the Salish Sea. This is the big ocean inlet near Seattle, Washington. The biggest issue was seagrass getting tangled in the propellers. Got a freaking sushi burrito here. So in this video, I'm gonna test out some alternative methods of propulsion and see if they are capable of being as efficient as my standard boat propellers. I've had issues with propeller fouling in quite a few of my previous videos, and the armchair engineering experts in the comments section have come up with just about every solution possible. Here are some of the ones that I'm not gonna test today. Razor sharp propellers could potentially work on a speedboat with faster spinning propellers, but my propellers are big and spin slow for high efficiency. For that reason, they probably wouldn't be able to cut through weeds, even if they were razor sharp. Large propellers on real boats are less prone to seagrass, but they do have issues getting tangled in rope. For this, line cutters are used on the prop shafts. I'm not very confident that this sort of a thing would work for my application because the seagrass seems to accumulate on the prop blades themselves, not just the shaft. Next up is wire mesh prop guards. In order for wire mesh to keep out the thinnest of weeds, it would need to be pretty fine. And putting fine mesh around a propeller, or really anywhere under the waterline, is just terrible for efficiency. Water jet propulsion is great for things like jet skis and river boats that need to operate in shallow water, but compared to a normal propeller, it's also very inefficient. Last up is the classic paddle wheel. Generally, paddle wheels are less efficient than propellers, but I think that if you made one big enough, it could be pretty comparable. In this video, I am going to test what might be a more optimized but similar concept to the paddle wheel. So after I had decided that I wanted to test alternative propulsion methods, I headed back to the lake for one last test drive with the old propellers to collect some efficiency data. We're going to be looking at watt hours per kilometer, and this data is collected by the ArduPilot rover flight controller on board. So after that, I headed back home and removed to the old drivetrain. So the first alternative propulsion method I'm going to try out is a linkage-driven paddle. I got this idea after seeing some other online videos of people trying this out. It looked pretty weedproof and efficient. This mechanism has an advantage over regular old paddle wheels because the path that the paddle takes through the water is more effective. The geometry can also be adjusted to fine-tune the paddle's entrance and exit out of the water to minimize drag. I kind of think about it like a paddle wheel being compared to a highly inefficient walking gait, and the linkage mechanism being more like a proper human walking gait. I drew up this model in Onshape that converts a rotary motion from a low-KV brushless motor into the paddling motion. Onshape is a cloud-based CAD program that runs in your internet browser, and it's free to hobbyists. So if you want to download or modify my designs, click on the link in the description and sign up for a free Onshape account. Then you'll have full access to the mechanism and all the other designs in this video. I 3D printed a lot of the parts out of Grey Pro Resin on the Formlabs Form 3 Plus, and I FDM printed some of the bigger parts. I used my CNC router to cut out a paddle out of thin plywood. That got a layer of varnish to make it waterproof. I'm using 15 millimeter carbon tubes as the legs of the linkage. Okay, this is my first time powering up the motor. Let's see what happens. Whoa, it's so smooth. Oh, that's awesome. This is forwards. <laughs> oh, that's great. What happens if we crank it up? <laughs> Previously, this boat steered using differential thrust with its two underwater propellers. Since it's only going to have one paddle, it now needs a rudder to steer. I cut one out of some 8th inch acrylic and then 3D printed some little hinges for it and then glued those onto the back side of the hull. After that, it was time to head back to the lake for a test drive. Hey baby, you like my autonomous boat? <laughs> oh yeah. This paddle very well may be the next biggest leap forward for maritime efficiency since the days of Christopher Columbus. But do you know what very well might be the next biggest leap in efficiency for your lifestyle? It's Factor Meals. Skip all those time-consuming trips to the grocery store and get Factor. Factor lets you avoid the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up that comes with cooking, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy, then get back to doing whatever you like to do. Sign up for Factor and you get to choose from over 35 weekly flavor-packed meals that promote a healthy lifestyle. Round out your meals and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of 45 plus add-ons to suit your taste. This month, I tried some of their Protein Plus meals like spinach and mushroom chicken thighs. Factor meals come in a refrigerated box with ice packs, mm. so you never have to worry about thawing them out or freezer burn like those frozen meals from the grocery store. Just pop them in the microwave for a minute and a half and they're ready to enjoy. This one here is the Peanut Buddha Boy, a great option for you vegetarians out there. Another one I tried this month is the Queso Fundito. Not only was it delicious, but it's also gluten-free. Head to Factor75.com or click on the link below and use code RCTESTFLIGHT50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. I had to do a little bit of paddle height adjustment so that it wasn't hitting the water on the backstroke. <laughs> it's scooting. Yeah. It kind of scoots along. Wow. <laughs> Going at a good clip. Yeah, it's pretty fast. 
<laughs> it's so silly looking. <laughs> I was pleasantly surprised that this thing worked really well with hardly any adjustment. It was even capable of going decently fast, which I was not expecting. At low and medium speeds, the paddle looked like it was entering the water pretty smoothly with very little splashing, which is good. On the exits, it looks like the paddle starts the return stroke a little too low because it was splashing a bit. At higher speeds, this was more visible. It would also sometimes splash on entry, but I think this was in part due to the boat pitching up and down with waves. Here I went to full throttle, which put a lot of stress on the gears and linkages. Combine this with the paddle slapping into waves, and it was enough force to cause the gears to start skipping. Uh-oh, it just started making a weird noise. Turns out one of the axles had just slid out of place. It was an easy fix, but I'd say this mechanism is only good for slow speeds. It's definitely not robust enough for super high speed driving. With this program called Motion Gen, we can visualize the exact path that the paddle takes through the water. The cool thing about this program is that you can change the geometry and see how it affects the path in real time. Pretty useful for mechanical linkages like this. What was your idea? <laughs> I thought the paddle needs to have a hinge so when it recovers forward, it's going sideways through the air or water and it can uh, waste a lot less energy. So as per Colin's idea, I integrated a flapper here, a little pivot hinge onto the paddle. So it cannot pivot this way, but it can pivot on the return stroke. We'll see how this works. There it goes. With the hinge installed, the paddle would just fold back when it entered into the water. This could also indicate that the paddle is mounted a bit too low, and maybe mounting it higher would allow it to accelerate more closely to the speed of the vessel before it enters into the water. <laughs> it totally sucks. At higher speeds, the paddle would be folded during the entire return stroke, and it wouldn't even have a chance to straighten out before entering the water. I tried more rubber bands to stiffen up the hinge, and that seemed to help a little bit, but you can still see the paddle pivoting on entry into the water. Maybe this is a good thing though, tough to say. I bet you if you do an efficiency run, it'll still be better. You think? Yeah, I do think. Well, we can test that. Let's do it. Here's the efficiency data in milliamp hours per kilometer. It's really difficult to eyeball the average efficiency since the value spikes when the paddle is under the highest load. I tried to smooth out the data by adding an RC filter on the current measurement signal wire, but for some reason that didn't work. I'll have to save that problem for later. So the next day I printed new mounting brackets so that the paddle could be mounted up higher. The paddle is even above the lowest point on the hulls now, so it can spin freely on land. I would guess this will give us more efficiency, but maybe less peak thrust? I don't know. This dog just wants me to play fetch. <laughs> you can see how the paddle enters and exits the water super smoothly. Even at higher speeds, it's way better than before. At this point, it even just seemed efficient. There was very little splashing, very little noise, and all around it seemed like a very respectable propulsion system. Here's some slow motion, 240 frame per second video of the paddle at the highest mounting position. This is during acceleration. And this is during sustained speed. It still looks pretty good. Here's a front view. It definitely looks like the paddle speed almost exactly matches the water speed as it enters. That's great for efficiency. There was a nice lady on shore that was so stoked on how good the video from her new phone looked that she offered to send it to me. So here it is. Thanks, lady. Oh, and it's uh, remote controlled. Yeah. Wow. So I did a bunch of different tests with the paddle. I had it super high, super low, and everywhere in between. Also super floppy and fixed in place. Then I went home and analyzed all the RD Pilot log data. To fix the spikes in the current draw problem, Sebastian added some filtering to this Mav Explorer efficiency equation, and this is what we get. Nice, smooth efficiency data. I'm saving the grand efficiency data comparison for the end of this video, since we still have one more propulsion method to test out. This next one is maybe going to be slightly less interesting than the paddle, but quite possibly more practical. I've used air propellers on some of my autonomous boats in the past, and they are just about as seaweed proof as it gets. But the reason why I've shied away from them on recent builds is that they are quite a bit less efficient than underwater propellers. This is true in most cases, but it turns out that there are some exceptions. I recently found out that the record holder for the world's fastest human-powered water vehicle uses an air propeller instead of a water propeller. They're able to get away with this because the air propeller is absolutely huge. Turns out, if your air propeller is big enough, a 3 meter diameter in this case, with a high enough coefficient of lift, the efficiency can be as high as 90%. Furthermore, the hardware associated with mounting an air propeller has negligible drag, whereas the housing required for an underwater propeller has a significant drag penalty. This part totally reminds me of what I found during my hydrofoil ground effect vehicle experiments. Having anything underwater at high speeds has a terrible drag penalty, even if it's a sleek hydrodynamic design. It's best to have as little surface area touching the water as possible. But anyways, bigger propellers are generally more efficient than smaller propellers. 
This is true for both air and water propellers, but it's more difficult to make a water propeller really big. That's because you need a deeper hull or a deeper prop housing to accommodate it, which both come with significant drag penalties. So let's try out a huge air propeller. This is the same 8108 100 kV multirotor motor that I was using on the paddle, but now it's got a prop. A 30 inch prop, that is. That's pretty big. It's hard to tell because of the camera frame rate and shutter speed, but the prop is spinning quite slowly. At a cruise speed of around one knot, you can visibly see the propeller go round and round. It took very little throttle to cruise nice and slow, and when I would raise the throttle a bit, it would get moving pretty quickly. Here I got up to 2 meters per second. But the max speed is kind of irrelevant, because I had the throttle PWM artificially capped so that I wouldn't pull too much current and burn something out. I was using pretty small ESCs on this thing. But anyways, the goal isn't speed, it's efficiency. And nothing's worse for efficiency than towing around weeds. I just can't get away from them. They were stuck on the rudder and the prop protector fins for the old underwater props. So what did I do? I went home and took the rudder off and then cut the fins off and sanded the holes down smooth. Then it was back to the lake. But wait, how am I going to steer without a rudder? Aha, differential thrust. I added a second propeller, so now we have double the disc area, which is even more efficient than before. Check this out. There was a lake steam tornado. How neat is that? The dual air propellers worked great. No surprises here. And now there's absolutely nothing on the bottom of the boat for weeds to get stuck on. Double the motors also means double fast. It got up to 4 meters per second this time. So finally, the moment we've all been waiting for. It's time to compare the efficiency data. Let's start off by looking at the different paddle configurations. It's no surprise that the paddle was most efficient at its highest mounting position. And at this position, the pivoting paddle wasn't really doing that much. The data shows that a rigid mounted paddle was maybe like 10% more efficient than the pivoting paddle. But that difference could just be in the noise. Tough to say. As for the air propellers, the dual propellers were this much more efficient than the single propeller. Pretty good. So here's the grand comparison between all three. It turns out everything was better than the water propellers. This sort of surprised me, but also sort of didn't. The water propellers just have so much less disc area than the air propellers and the paddle. Although I guess you can't really call the paddle disc area. Also, the water propellers have to transfer power through long shafts and stuffing boxes to keep the water from leaking into the hulls. With the air propellers, we ditch all that inefficiency. The biggest surprise here is probably that the paddle even beat the water propellers, but I think it really comes down to surface area. When it comes to aircraft design, there's really no replacement for wingspan. If you want to make a plane more efficient, make its wingspan larger. That's why I made the paddle as wide as possible. There's less opportunity for the water getting pushed to just flow around the edges and create tip vortices. I think that if we made a paddle with the same surface area as the water propellers have disc area, then it would for sure be less efficient. But our paddle is huge compared to the water propellers, so it's just going to be more efficient. The dual air propellers are clearly superior, so let's put them to use and retry the big waypoint mission that this boat had previously failed. Okay, it's off, doing its own thing. I gotta be careful because there's giants lurking in the shadows. Okay, I got the boat launched. We're heading out into the ocean and I think I see our autonomous friend out there. So we gotta go chase it down now. There's a tugboat pulling a barge out there. Probably coming from Alaska. There's the city skyline sticking up over the hill with Mount Rainier. Pretty majestic. It's a lot more choppy out here than I was expecting. Especially considering that the wind forecast was like less than five miles an hour all day. That's weird. Hopefully it glasses off later. What the heck? This thing is doing circles. That's weird. Well, it's a good thing we're already here. We can see what's wrong. What the heck? Maybe a motor went out. Whoa, the props are hitting the water. Oh no. Whoa, I did not expect the props to be hitting the water. Damn, I guess it's too wavy for it out here. That sucks. Jiminy Christmas. Well, I think we've just failed the mission. Man, look at that sunrise. All right, let's put it back into auto mode and see if it behaves now. I just took this big, heavy battery off, so hopefully that prevents the props from hitting the water. Oh, there it goes. Ah, they're still hitting the water. Then I tried taking off another battery. At this point, it probably wouldn't have had enough capacity on board to complete the whole waypoint mission. Keep it going then. Off you go. I think I'm gonna call it quits at that. This mission just failed because I did not anticipate it being this wavy out here. 
because the forecast called for super, super calm winds today, like as low as the wind forecast ever gets, and yet it's still super wavy. Which is weird because I've been out here in the evenings when it's typically windier and seen it just be perfectly glassy before, so very difficult to predict the waves out here. I've had two fails in a row with this boat. We need to get serious now, design something that's really good. So surely I could make this boat work by just moving the propellers up away from the water, but I think I've just about milked this boat dry in terms of YouTube interest. So the next time I attempt this waypoint mission will be with an entirely new boat design. Wow, look at all the puffins. Woohoo, windmilling baby. That's pretty much it for this video, but quickly one more thing. My previous video was about testing toroidal propellers versus normal propellers on my electric paddleboard. In that video, I said that I was going to host a propeller design competition where I would print and test designs that viewers send in. I just wanted to remind those interested in submitting a design to follow rctestflight underscore on Instagram. That's where I'll be posting more info on where and when to submit your designs. Thanks for watching. Bye. That thing is just plowing the water. Wow. Also, that's a super short little tugboat. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. oh, that was a huge wake. There's a big sea lion or something out here. Oh, there he is. This guy's looking for some fish.